Here we go. So I'm just going to run through a few housekeeping things first. Oh, we, are we missing a few slides, it appears. Um, I would just like to thank the University of Lilibet um, in Denmark for the use of this Adobe conference room and also the Association of Radical Midwives. Um, and um, if you need any help with setting up sound, you click on the little, you, uh, if you need audio setup, you click on meeting and then you complete the audio setup on the, on, on the drop down menu. To switch your microphone on, you press the little white microphone at the top and you select your speaker and um, you should be, we should be able to hear you. If you'd like to um, select a status, you can click on the little drop down menu of the man with his arms up and you can applaud. And if you would like to ask a question, we would love to hear from you. Please raise your hand and then afterwards you just clear your status. Um, we love chat in the chat box. And I see Trish has also got a dog that she's had to send to another room. Um, oh, yes. And <laughs> um, you just fill out the chat box. It will be um, taken down and saved so we can use it down in the future. Have I remembered everything, Deb? So you did a brilliant job. <laughs> yeah, great. Thank you. Okay, so now we have the lovely Trish Ross from California. Um, she has had a long career in training and organizational development. Um, in 1995, Trish was ordained as a deacon, and at 53, Trish trained as a midwife. Currently, Trish works as an education director of Midwives on a Mission of Service. You can see their slide up on the screen. And at the moment, they work in Sierra Leone, teaching birth attendants to broaden and deepen their knowledge and encouraging them to become community change agents and maternity care providers. So welcome, Trish. Thank you very much. Um, I am hoping that uh, the story of what moms does is something that everybody can relate to to some extent or another. Making change happen to improve the care that women get is important, and I think it's a worldwide issue. I really want you to ask questions. I'm going to tell you some things about what we do, what we have found to work. Uh, I'll also talk about some of the problems that we face and hope that we can um, learn from each other. So if anyone has some ideas, questions, comments, please either put it in the chat or wave your hand, and I'll be glad to, um, to, to address the issues. Well, that's kind of what I was just saying. Um, it's really easy to do a lousy job of training. Um, most of us have the experience of having some really terrible teachers in our lifetime. Um, and it, it's a shame. And in the case of dealing with the um, traditional birth attendants of Sierra Leone, which is where I work, uh, usually it is the learner group that gets the blame for, for not learning. Midwives on Missions of Service is a teeny tiny little NGO. Our annual budget is under $40,000, which is a rounding error for many of our larger colleagues like Save the Children or World Vision who are also working in Sierra Leone. Sadly, they don't um, have the kind of results that we do. And it's, it's interesting, and that's one of the things that I want to address, is what makes us with our low budget and uh, really, in some ways, inefficient methodology uh, a lot more effective uh, than some of the folks that have a lot more money to put into this. We have made about 15 trips to Sierra Leone since 2006. Uh, in November of this year will be our 10th anniversary in Sierra Leone, and we're going to have a big party among all the women that we've trained. Um, we've actually trained 
uh, over 290 women. The government wants us to call them community health workers, so we do. The women want to call themselves traditional birth attendants, so we do that too. So I'm going to use both both terms, and I know that both of those are fraught, um, very emotionally related, um, and I tend to use the term TBA because that's what the women want me to call them, and so I do. We've worked in seven. <laughs> We've taught seven different classes, and over the over the ten years, and we've had some timeouts because of uh, world con world economic conditions, and uh, personally, almost going bankrupt during 2009, and that that set us out. Then we also had a year and a half layout during Ebola, um, because of my age, I was not permitted by the government to go back into the country. I'm 64 now. Uh, and they would not let people come in over the age of 60 to, to be volunteers. So that really hurt us and our work and slowed us down. But even so, we've uh, made some significant differences. Here's some quotes. Um, I think you, throughout these presentations, you guys are going to get a lot of numbers. So I was decided to give you some words about the, the effects of, of what we do. Um, and these quotes come mostly from the medical health team at the district level. And for those of you not familiar with Sierra Leone's um, polity, the um, district is like a county in the United States or perhaps a, a, a parish in, in some states. But it's um, smaller than a state. <laughs> um, and there is a uh, district medical officer and a district medical health team in charge, and uh, they're the folks in the government at the part of the Ministry of Health and Sanitation that we work with. These are also quotes from the paramount chiefs, who are the, the regional kings, and um, just some, some regular folks. Uh, basically, they're happy with what we do and they want us to do more. We have four primary success factors, or let's, let me say that differently. There's four things that we do that seem to us to be the things that differentiate us from other people and contribute to our success. Uh, as time goes by, I might figure these things out a little differently, uh, gain some insight, and, and talk about them differently. But this is where we are now. Um, and the most important aspect is, is relationship building. And this is part of why uh, we have a hard time getting grants, um, because the grantors look at our model and say, this is too relationship intensive. You have to keep going back. You have to keep spending time with these people. And that's just not the way we want to do. We, it's, that's not effective. Um, We've been told if we used more technology, uh, if we used fewer people, uh, that or if we did a one-time training and didn't go back and do continuing education, that they'd be much more likely to give us grants. And and those are part those for us are an integral part of our program, and and we're not going to compromise on those things. Um, okay, I got some input to put them mic away from my mouth. I'm sorry if I'm spitting at you guys. Another success factor from my perspective is, is we use really good teachers. There's an ongoing discussion in the field of training, which is actually my professional background, uh, between the subject matter expert sharing knowledge, expertise, and the professional trainer, who is often perceived as somebody who doesn't really know anything. And what we try to do is find someone who has both sets of skills. Um, somebody who knows lots and lots and lots of things, but can't communicate, can't teach effectively, is, not, is, is wasting everybody's time. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you're also wasting everybody's time. So we look really, really hard for people who can teach, who can teach using adult learning methodology, uh, and do it right. 
We also provide structure for ongoing support. We don't. We talk about some agencies that parachute in, do their thing, and then bug out using using military language. We we don't do that. We we make a commitment for long, the long term. Now that long term commitment is not to build dependence. It is not to, to we don't take over their jobs. We don't do their work for them. But it, it lets them know that we are with them, that we are as committed as they are to doing the work and making the changes that need to be made, that we will support them. This is um, uh, something that's really a key, an, another key factor for us. And that has to do then with you know, continuing uh, and deepening the relationships. So we face a lot of questions um, when we talk about this, and you know, how do you build relationships across cultures and distances? I I live in Northern California. Uh, I'm three to four hours away from San Francisco International Airport. Then I have a 12-hour flight, 10 to 12-hour flight into Europe, a layover, and then a, a seven to eight-hour flight into Freetown, and then a four to five-hour flight. Uh, drive to our headquarters in Bo, and like on this last trip, then we had an 18-hour drive to the site of our training. Um, how do I get, how do I maintain a relationship with these folks? And the answer, the short answer is, is, is it's hard. It's really hard. Another big issue is prioritizing the various group of stakeholders. The Ministry of Health has some really strong opinions about how to do this work and what they want to see. The women who are pregnant have really strong opinions about how they're cared for. These opinions often differ, and we, we balance that. And when I talk about reciprocity, I'm talking about the whole notion of post-colonialism. Um, we insist that we have a reciprocal relationship between moms and the women that we train, the TBAs, and we build relationships between the two of us, and then we also loop in the district health team, the district medical officer, the paramount chiefs, uh, the local village leaders, the leaders of the women's society, and we sit down together and hammer out a relationship from the very beginning, and then we, we work to maintain that. And again, it's hard. We build relationships one person at a time. I delivered this baby by accident. I had I typically don't deliver many babies when I'm there because if I do, it sometimes sends the message that uh, the local people are not adequate or um, that for some reason or another I, I need to do it. And it also sets up a, a strange dynamic where people will come in and, and want me to deliver their babies. And I, I don't want that. I want to elevate the, the status of the woman that we're working with. And uh, if I'm going in and delivering babies, that, that doesn't happen for a variety of reasons. But uh, this baby was in the, I was in the clinic answering some questions from the staff. And a woman came in pushing, and I delivered this baby. <laughs> and it um, was premature, probably gestational age of about 34 weeks. And here it's several weeks old, and she's thriving and doing well. And uh, I just couldn't resist cuddling her. But that's how we build the relationships. One person, one baby, one woman, one of our learners at a time. Uh, this is a woman who is now uh, the newest member of the Moms Leadership Council. And she knew that she was supposed to do prenatal exams, but she didn't know what she was looking for. Um, and so in spending some time with her and letting her listen and talking, okay, so you know, what are you hearing? Tell me what you're hearing. And so she's beating out. Um, the heart rate that she's hearing, and we're talking about how to discriminate between the mother's and the fetal heart rate. And she didn't know that 
you could do that. So it's taking that time um, and interacting with them one on one and, and doing this kind of teaching that's uh, side by side and, you know, sweating together in a tiny little room that's 95 degrees and when it's raining outside and uh, learning to work together like that is, is critical. <laughs> Here's one of, this is one of my favorite pictures. I'm sorry, I had to show it. Um, this is one of my favorite volunteers. Um, she, she had never danced before. She was brought up in a, in a religious organization that did not support dancing. But it is um, common for the women to dance. And I dance, and, and the other volunteers usually dance. And so this volunteer decided to dance, too. And she was really having a great time. Um, uh, there's a question in the chat that, uh, from Monique. And member of what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear it broke up, and I'm not sure to what you're referring. Um, so if you could clarify your question, I'd be glad to answer it. Hi, you Trish, have questions Courtney about? has her hand up. Oh, I'm Would sorry. Like to ask a question, Courtney? Yes. That's all right. I will give you the microphone, Courtney. You're up. Hi, Courtney. OK, if you go to the top, you see where the microphone is. You select the drop down menu and select your microphone and then you click on the mic to make it turn green. OK. Well, we'll keep trying, Courtney. You just let me know if you'd like the mic back again. OK. OK. Thanks, Courtney, for trying. If you can get it, go for it. Um, I talk about instructional soundness a lot. Um, and it actually has a technical definition, but briefly, it is effective training. Uh, and there's a lot of factors that go into making it effective. And there are training geeks that, that get PhDs and this kind of stuff. Um, and part of it is to, we, we make sure that we have professional trainers develop and edit our programs and, do, and validate them. With my background, I am a professional instructional designer and, and was for 25 years and did organizational development consulting. So this whole notion of how people learn, how people work together to, to uh, form an organization that works um, is something that's kind of in my wheelhouse. And the other primary person, the president of, of MOMS, also has a background in education and uh, and. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in education and an MBA. So this com combination of business and education and midwifery, we're able to bring that all together and uh, ensure that uh, everything is, is done well. Uh, how do we set effective group criteria for volunteers? And this has been trial and error, and we've made some mistakes. Fortunately, I've managed people in my previous career for a bunch of years, and I made some terrible, terrible, terrible hiring mistakes. Um, very nice people in most cases, but just a lousy hire. And um, I learned how not to do that <laughs> over the years. And I try to apply those things here when we, when we look, talk to volunteers. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. A third question is keeping clear on who the client is. And there's a lot of nonprofits that start conflating the volunteers with the clients. And they start redesigning and shifting their program around to accommodate the desires of the volunteers. And, and we 
kind of hard nosed about that, and we, we just we just don't do that. And if that means that Chris, the the president, whom I referred to just a few minutes ago, if it means that she and I are the only teachers on the trip, we're the only teachers on the trip. We prefer to have more. We take small teams because the villages we go to are are very small, very poor, uh, and a team more than a four or five people would would overwhelm the village. They, it would cost them money and set them back economically for months to, to have us there. Um, so we, we kind of don't do that. Teaching effectively, um, we choose people who, who have proven themselves to be effective teachers, to be thoughtful, um, and, and have appropriate experience. And we just, as I mentioned before, we just simply insist on that. And it's hard sometimes. Uh, we have taken some younger people, and they have been good. And we've taken some younger people, and they were just really in over their heads. Part of the issue is that Sierra Leone is the poorest nation on earth and has the world's worst maternal mortality ratios. Uh, the maternal mortality rate is 1,360 per 100,000. Um, and it's 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 a hard place to work. It's it's really hard. Um, three quarters of the population live below the official World Health Organization poverty level, and um, it's it's grievous to 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 witness that. Here we've got um, a woman. I, I love this volunteer. Um, she is demonstrating. She's being the patient or the the client, um, while the uh, learners are practicing how to work with her, how to how to treat her more gently, um, how to offer support uh, in labor. This is a concept that's utterly new to them. They've never done this kind of thing before. It's it's just not something they, they know how to do. So we give them a lot of opportunities to, to handle our bodies and to, to let them experiment with us. And, and, and you know, somebody will put, put counter pressure on my sacrum, and it's like, wow, that's too hard. And so I'm able to give them good feedback. And so this kind of modeling and this kind of hands-on interchange with them um, is something that we do, and you can see um, the smiles on the faces of the other learners that they're really enjoying um, this. It makes it memorable. Uh, in this particular class, only one woman spoke English. Two people, two of the women had, had gone, had attended some kind of school. Um, the, more, the most experienced scholar there had gone up to the sixth form, um, or the sixth primary, six year in primary school. Uh, the other one had, had dropped out of school at, in the second year of primary school. So we're, we're working with women who, who are very inexperienced in a classroom. And so this kind of hands-on, um, relaxed attitude and interaction with them is, is very helpful and helps make things memorable. Since, because they don't have a book. They can't read. We give them a book. We give them a, a copy of the book for midwives. And usually there's somebody in the village who will read to them, read and translate for them, um, but not always. Um, so they, they can't take notes. They can't refer back to their notes. They can't refer to a syllabus. Uh, they can't refer to a book. So everything we do, we have to make memorable. And so if, if this is what we need to do, this is what we do. Here, this is me. Uh, I am delivering a baby, and Chris is the woman who is giving birth here. Um, and again, this is how we do things. We, we, we demonstrate. We're very visual, visually oriented. Uh, everything in our lesson plans is tested and tested and tested again. Uh, we have it vetted by senior midwives and by uh, instructional designers so that it's... We, have it checked out uh, from both perspectives. 
So the next series of questions has to do with, with sustaining the program. And a lot of times people start talking about belief or development and and getting clear on that difference between relief and development is, is an important part of doing this kind of work, this nonprofit work. Um, we ensure sustainability uh, in several ways. We each um, each of our groups that we teach elects a woman to be part of our leadership council. And here are five of them. The leaders meet regularly, um, usually about every other month, uh, depending on the weather. The rainy season, they can't they can't leave their villages. They can't get out of their villages. But during the dry season, they meet monthly. They meet together and talk about their problems. Um, some of the groups have been together for 10 years. We taught them 10 years ago. Some of them are brand new. They've had different experiences. They've had different troubles, problems. So they share those and uh, work together to find solutions. We come to them with, with questions like, you know, what kind of continuing education you know, should we be providing you guys? What kind of support should we be providing? And so they work together to, to answer those kinds of questions for us as well. I, I really like these women. They're, they're great women. Uh, we have two paid staff in Sierra Leone, and the woman on the left is Chita Rogers Sisse, and she is a, our full-time staff person. Um, and she visits, during the dry season, she visits our sites um, every month, and she comes and she brings them supplies. Um, this was actually during the time of Ebola. Where she she snuck through the blockade. This, this village was blockaded. Um, but she snuck through to take them some gloves. They had run out of, well, they didn't have gloves to begin with. And this village, Daru, was one of the very first in Sierra Leone to be hit with Ebola. And everyone at the clinic died um, of Ebola. And uh, they didn't have gloves. So we raised some money, sent her some money. She went out and had, had went to Liberia, actually, uh, and got some gloves. And then ran the blockade to come in and bring them gloves and bleach. So she's here delivering that stuff and talking with them, doing some teaching about uh, hand washing and how to teach the community about uh, sanitation. So these folks were doing the work of education before the government actually even acknowledged that there was an Ebola outbreak in this area. They were the ones on the ground doing the work before anyone else was. So I'm really, really proud of, of Jita for risking a lot to, to go up there and, and do this teaching and to take the supplies. And then to the people for being willing to listen and apply um, our suggestions at a time where they were really, really frightened. We do continuing education. We come back routinely. We, we make two trips a year. And part of one of those trips is usually to go around and visit all the people and to do different kinds of continuing education. Here we are doing uh, the Helping Babies Breathe program, where we take a group of four to six people and teach them the Helping Babies Breathe model of newborn resuscitation. And we take all day, and um, they do it again and again and again and again and again and again. Um, and we have a great deal of fun doing it, but it's a lot of hard work. We've also done uh, continuing education programs on breast self-exams and a variety of other things. Whatever they ask us to do, we try to do. So this whole notion of continuing relationships across a distance is hard. And Jita um, does a lot of it during the year. Um, she, she lives in a house where there's no electricity. And um, she has a cell phone and is usually in cell phone range. The villages where we teach are seldom in cell phone range and don't have any electricity. So 
electronic communications is not effective. So JITA is out every month um, in the dry season uh, in these villages, talking, listening, listening, listening. And then when we go back, uh, we usually go in the dry season so we can get to these places. And uh, we listen. We'll just sit around a mango tree and um, and talk. They talk and, and we listen. And that's um, an essential part of what we do. And it's it's critical. So we make the time for these small groups. That's me over on the left. You can see my feet. I tried to crop myself out, but I see I didn't do a very good job. Um, this is six women of our leadership council. One woman's husband had just died, and so she was not able to attend. Uh, but it's six of the seven women on the leadership council talking about what their issues are. One of the groups is having some, some problems. Um, there's a you know, there's a faction that doesn't want to participate with the others, and so they're talking to each other about how to how to help with that. Um, and we kind of sit there with our mouths shut and let them solve their problems. Uh, they're, yes, they're illiterate, but that doesn't mean they're stupid. And they're very experienced, very skilled, and um, and we just provide the moral support and the encouragement, and we have faith in them and their abilities. And they find that they have the strength and the knowledge to, to do these things and to, to make these changes. Right now, we're in the process of training four new trainers. Uh, we all have always had the goal of this being a whole entirely self-sustaining um, program. Uh, again, we're looking at development rather than relief. We're not solving problems in a crisis. We're building capacity. We're creating independence. So we're training these four women that you see here to train the program. Um, and we're doing it rigorously as we, as we do everything uh, in terms of, of the instruction. This is not a, you know, a one day train the trainer kind of thing. We spent five days with them teaching, talking about how to train and our values and philosophies and how that affects our decisions. And then they watched us train a class, and we're going to do that two more times. So two more weeks of training, and they're going to be with us on two more classes. The third class, they're going to do most of the training with our supervision. And then they'll get their certificates. And they'll be able to do four times as much work at about a quarter of the cost that we can, and I think that's fabulous. We'll be able to go on to other areas of the country. And again, Dancing um, is, is a big part of what we do. And we get out there and, and dance with them and have a wonderful time. This is, again, another uh, celebration at the end of a, of a class session. Uh, we give the women their certificates and um, have a great time. They show the community skits and teach backs and sing songs that they have created during class. Uh, about family planning, about breastfeeding, about how to know the signs of labor so that you can walk the 10 miles to the clinic and get to the clinic in time for the birth, all these kinds of things. And uh, we applaud and cheer and laugh, and it's, and it's absolutely wonderful. And we dance. So this is, this is us. Um, this is Chris McManus and me, and under my arm is Jita Rogers, our staff person. And to her, to her side is Alpha Sase, who and they they got married a couple of years ago, actually. So they're now a married couple. Um, and behind this slide, which you can't see behind this photo, is my contact information. I thought I had made this photo transparent. Um, and um, I have, there's a question about our key workers uh, and the level of, of education. Yes, Jita is a public health nurse in Sierra Leone. And um, these two women, uh, the two women on the left, are 
maternal child health care aides who ha also had additional training. The woman, um, the third woman from the left, is in the maternal child health care aid school. Uh, she also has high school uh, education and actually has attended some college classes and did some work with, used to work with Oxfam during the war. So all of the women have uh, additional education. Oops, let me go back. So uh, if you want to ask me questions, get in touch with me personally. Our website is Global Midwives, G-L-O-B-A-L, -L, Midwives. Um, let me write it in here. And my, so at, my email. Questions. Oh. Yeah. I'll answer questions. Um, I was wondering, you were talking about resources. Um, what resources do you use with the women? Um, we use as little as possible because, again, of our emphasis on sustainability, uh, if it's not available in country, we try not to create them being dependent on us for material. We do take gloves. We do um, send money uh, and buy them bleach. Uh, for, for training materials, we, we take inexpensive models and um, charts there that they will use when they do their continuing education. They meet month, most of the groups meet monthly. After we leave them, they continue the class will continue meeting monthly. And they will use the, the charts and models to practice with and to refresh themselves with. So it's all cheap stuff. And um, you were talking at the beginning about some of the challenges um, that you come across when you're working over there. What other yeah. challenges do you um, have? There's, well, first of all, the government of Sierra Leone tends to not take us seriously because we're so small. And so we had a hard time even getting to the table with, with some of these folks. Um, actually, on one of our early trips, the district medical officer sent us home because he said we had nothing to offer. And what we had nothing was, was um, a gratuity to... Um, help him consider us. And we, we don't pay bribes. And that does, that means that a lot of doors don't open. They're small. And so a lot of folks just simply don't think we can do much. Um, we're women. And that also um, fails to open doors for us. Most of our fundraising is um, me and Chris begging people. And I'm, I'm allowed. I'm a lousy fundraiser, honestly. Uh, I'm a great trainer. I'm a good midwife, <laughs> and I'm a lousy fundraiser. Um, so we, we we face those things. Uh, as I mentioned, the many of the large grantors um, struggle with our model because it is so relationship oriented, and they they want us to create PowerPoint decks and leave those. Um, they want us to uh, create apps for the cell phones um, with, with protocols and, and different things on it. And, and those folks who do those things are getting a lot of money. Um, and sometimes they get really sad. Um, but we, ju we just keep doing what we do, and uh, it works. It works. It's effective. It's slow, and it's effective.
Ja. Well, that sounds like that's about it. Well, thank you. Um, yes, and if you um, would, <laughs> you, you, you ask me and I'll, and I'll answer. That's that's again, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a good diplomat. Um, if you go to uh, either our website or our Facebook page, and uh, you'll find donate buttons all over the place uh, on our website. Uh, our Facebook page is uh, facebook.com slash global midwives. Let me key that in. Uh, there's a, a donate button there under the cover photo. Uh, we also are always looking for volunteers. Um, there's a process for that, and on the website there's a, there's a page for volunteers and some stuff you can download and an application and some discussion of our philosophy. Um, and again, just raising awareness about what we are doing is, is really important. We all, you know, Jenny says, you know, we'll spread the word. Thank you. I, I, I just love that. I love knowing that people from all over, know what we're doing and care what we're doing. That that means an awful lot to us. When I'm itchy and sweaty and hot and have malaria and I have to take a bucket bath in cold water, <laughs> you know, knowing that somebody cares means a lot. I do. I do. I'm just absolutely in love with this with this work. <laughs> I'm silly. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>